Hello,、uh, my name is Keiko Yokota Carter. I'm a Japanese studies librarian at the Asian Library. It is my great pleasure to introduce、uh, Stephen Jeffrey,、uh, Mr. Stephen Jeffrey Brown, data analytic visualization specialist, Northeastern University Libraries, Tohoku Daigaku in Boston. You know. Stephen is a kind of digital Renaissance man with many interests. He earned his Masters,、uh, Masters of Science in Monocular Biophysics from Yale University, and his BA in Asian Studies and Chemistry from St. Olaf College. He has lived in Tokyo as a Fulbright Fellow in Compu Computational Biophysics Research at Kyoto University. Just last week, he presented his project on atomic narratives, U.S. and Japanese textbook accounts of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the Japanese Association for Digital Humanities Conference in Kyoto, Japan. Today, he's going to talk about a new research method methodology, digital humanities, and his visualization projects by using the open access data, a Japanese language data sets. After his lecture, he will have individual consultation session for you.、Uh, there will still three、uh, slots available. Please feel free to talk to me、uh, if you are interested in the individual session, because each person has different、uh, research project and、uh, questions. It is a part of the Thursday lecture event, and I really appreciate the support from the Center for Japanese Studies to invite Stephen to Michigan campus. Uh, let me briefly talk about today's lecture's background. Today's lecture came out from the ideas that some of the CJS students with,、uh, shared with me. The two, 2017 cohort of the students have shown strong interest in learning digital scholarship since they started the academic year last year. To respond to their interest, I, as their Japanese studies librarian, organized a workshop for text mining in English, text,、uh, English language last semester as a start. So, next step is to introduce them to Japanese language digital scholarship method. I met Stephen in Facebook,、uh, <laughs> Digital Humanities in Japan、uh, Facebook group. He posted his work on the Facebook, and I look at his work of text mining visualization, work of、uh, using the data sets、uh, from the Japan Disasters Archive at Harvard University. As、uh, some, of, uh, some of you may have seen it, it is impressive.、Uh, then I look at his homepage and look at bi his bio biography. He has studied in a variety of disciplines. And become a visualization research librarian, and knows Japanese language, and lived and studied in Japan, and he is around CJS student age. To me, he is a perfect match. And someone who has been trying to design one's, design one's life while learning and expanding one's horizon in digital scholarship, multiple disciplines, and Japanese language studies. By the way, What is digital humanities?、Uh, briefly, for example, in recent ecology f i e l d they use X ray, laser beam, DNA analysis technology to find what is not visible with our eyes. Then, how about literature, words, and letters? Can we dig out what are not seen by just reading? What is equivalent for X ray, laser beam, DNA analysis for narrative text? Today,、uh, we are going to hear、uh, Steve's explanation of what we can see from the text. Please welcome Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me with my microphone? Good to go. Okay, so I. I'm Stephen Jeffrey Braun.、Um, I'm the data analytics and visualization specialist in the Northeastern University Libraries in something that's called the Digital Scholarship Group, which is an applied research group in the libraries. So, in this role, I provide support to students, faculty, and、uh, staff on campus who want to integrate some sort of data analysis 
or data visualization components into the digital scholarship. And when I say data, data, uh, data visualization, I talk about a few different things. So I mean sort of the conventional representations of visualization that we might all know already. So for example, bar charts, line charts, scatter plots and pie charts, right? These are all things that we're already familiar with that we probably all made ourselves. And I provide support on campus for helping sort of improve these kinds of charts and graphs. But I also do a lot of work with sort of more abstract forms of visualization. And those abstractions are what I'm more interested in, in working with. So as a couple of examples of some recent projects that don't involve Japan, here is a project that I worked on a couple years ago doing voice and text analysis on the speech that Donald Trump gave at the RNC um, in August a couple years ago. And this is a, a text analysis showing polarity of language in that speech. And sort of, this was sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, project where I was looking at demagoguery and how we can quantify that. Another example, again, not involving Japan whatsoever. This is a matrix representation of different flavor combinations. So I'm a very avid cook and baker, and I have this book that's called The Flavor Thesaurus, which is literally a phys physical book that has combinations of good pairings of flavors. So I decided I wanted to turn that into a visualization, right? So these two things are visualizations in a form that we might not ordinarily be used to seeing, right? They're not normal charts and graphs, but they're abstractions. And so it's these kinds of abstractions I like to get people to think more about, a little bit more cr critically about, and think about how you can sort of integrate visual representation in novel ways in your research. So on campus, I provide the support through three primary capacities. The first capacity is as a consultant. I work one-on-one -on -one and give sort of targeted help to students, faculty, and staff on particular visualization tools and platforms, methodologies, and really sort of help people on their projects as they're in the middle of the project. I'm also a lecturer and a workshop facilitator. So I give lots of lectures across campus, across many different disciplines, including English, School of Business, Music, Arts and Design, where I talk about basic uh, methods of data analysis, for example. I also talk about critical thinking for data visualization or design thinking for data visualization. And I hold a lot of workshops on these topics as well. So I also do introductory workshops on tools like Adobe Illustrator, Tableau, Gephi, D3.js, which is a platform that I use a lot with in my own work. So I do those kinds of things as well. And the third capacity is I'm really an information designer. And this is the capacity that I'm most interested in, in working in, because this is the part where I get to think really critically about one question in particular. And that question is this, why do I visualize data? So this is a question that I actually ask a lot of students on campus at Northeastern because I really want to challenge people, especially in the information design program, to think about why they choose this particular medium for communicating information. And I can think of a variety of reasons why I might visualize data, all of which might be true to some extent, but only part of a bigger picture. So I might say that I visualize data because I'm attracted to its aesthetic qualities. Right? I appreciate visualization as an artistic practice. I think that's true. I could also say that I visualize data for its intellectual merits, that I find something very intellectually, intellectually satisfying about taking a very complex set of data or information and finding a way to communicate that clearly and effectively through images, geometries, colors. But those are only two parts of a much bigger picture. And I think more fundamentally, the reason that I visualize data is that for me, this is an exercise in perspectives. It really is a medium that en enables me to interrogate the sort of ethical, philosophical, theoretical underpinnings of the human condition and the ways that we integrate knowledge into our lives, the way that we produce knowledge, the way that we make conclusions about the world around us in a medium that is really compelling, visually compelling. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and I can sort of turn this into a statement by saying that visualization is a narrative discourse and this is primarily why I'm interested in this. It's a narrative di discourse that is graphically motivated, right? So I can reframe this, que this question and say, what does it mean to think of information visualization as a narrative medium? So this is the question that I want to explore a little bit by talking a little bit about some of the projects I've worked on in the past couple of years, specifically related to Japan, because it turns out that my experiences engaging with Japan, studying Japan, living in Japan, have informed me the most about the answer to this question. What does it mean to think of visualization as a narrative medium? 
So I'm going to talk about this through a combination of some projects, but I want to start by explaining a little bit about my background. Because moving forward, there's never really been any clear reason why I should be doing work with visualization. Right? It's never been sort of a destination that I've been moving towards. And I think that's true of a lot of people in the field today. I have a lot of colleagues in visualization who do research in visualization who came to visualization from other fields. Right? They, they found visualization to be a helpful tool, methodology, approach for their research that satisfied things that re methodologies in their own field couldn't satisfy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that for myself. So as Keiko mentioned, I received my bachelor's degree from St. Olaf College, a um, tiny private liberal arts college in southern Minnesota, in chemistry and Asian studies. And it was at St. Olaf that I was first introduced to this idea of visualization, although I wouldn't have called it visualization at the time. And specifically, I was introduced to one particular form of visualization, which was molecular visualization. So I was a chemistry student, which means that I spent a couple of years in the chemistry department doing research. And my research was computationally oriented, specifically looking at how we could use molecular visualization, molecular models of protein structures, to understand protein dynamics and understand protein sort of topological structure. And the more that I did this research, the more that I discovered that what I was really interested in in this research was not sort of the science behind it, but the visual images. I found images like this, this is DNA helicase, to be very visually compelling. And I actually created a project where I looked at one particular ribosomal structure, and I created this graphical user interface where you could sort of press a few buttons and produce a bunch of different visual representations of that particular structure. And I was really captivated by this, by this idea that you could look at one thing in multiple different visual ways just by changing different aspects of, of geometry or color. So I didn't quite realize that the visual aspect is what I was most attracted to. And I thought that I was destined to go into a career in the sciences. So as I was approaching graduation from undergrad, I was sort of faced with this challenge of integrating a life that did research in the sciences, the natural sciences, with this simultaneously evolving passion and interest in Japan, Japanese language and Japanese culture. So I found what I thought was the perfect solution to this challenge of integration, which was a Fulbright Fellowship. So I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship to do computational biophysics research in Japan, and I was given the Fulbright grant. So I spent a year uh, in Kyoto, at Kyoto Daigaku, Kyoto University, doing research in a computational biophysics lab, biophysics lab um, looking at different computational ways of representing molecular structure, particularly protein structures. And it was early on in this year, as a Fulbright Fellow, that I had an existential crisis. Because what happened was, about a month or two into doing my research project, I realized it's not the science that I'm interested in. It's not the science. And here I am doing research that's focused specifically on the science. So I remember this day very clearly when this crisis happened. And I went here. Anybody recognize this site? Kamogawa. This is a very, very important place in my life. This is the Kamo River in Kyoto. Runs right down to the heart of the city of Kyoto. And you see there are these turtle-shaped stones. I have spent many hours meditating on these stones. And it's, it's here that I sort of realized that I need to find a way to integrate my background and still interest in training in the sciences with this unshakable passion for Japan that's not going anywhere anytime soon, right? So I've been back to Kyoto a couple times since my Fulbright year. Um, I was just there last week. Here's another picture I took of the river. Um, this is going across Shijo Ohashi, going across Shijo Dori, that, that bridge right there. I was walking across the bridge, sort of not minding my own business, and saw all these people looking to the right, taking pictures. And I turned to the right, and this was the site. This was the vision that I saw. And it was a perfect vision because, you know, you see you have the mountains in the background, low-hanging clouds, just absolutely beautiful. So this is a very important place in my life because this river represents the challenge to integration that has sort of motivated everything I've done in the years since. And I've done a lot of different things since my Fulbright year. So after I came back to, to the United States from living in Kyoto, I entered a graduate program in biophysics at Yale, realized I didn't want to do biophysics anymore, so I left my master's. 
After that, I moved back to Minnesota and started a new job at the University of Minnesota, where I was basically an informaticist in the health sciences libraries. And in these experiences, I couldn't sort of shake my understanding of the fact that there is this real desire to work with visualization and sort of this emerging terminology vocabulary I had for thinking about it as visualization. So I eventually left the University of Minnesota and found this job at Northeastern University where I work specifically with visualization. And this has sort of helped satisfy one half of this challenge to integration, but there's still this other half, right? The other half being working with Japan in a really meaningful, intentional way. So I've had the opportunity to use visualization itself as a medium for integration. And in this sort of quest for integration, I've come to sort of organize my thinking around visualization in two big philosophies that really motivate all the work that I do. And these are really motivated too by my experiences living in Japan and studying Japan. So the first of this philosophy is that being critical practitioners and by that I mean consumers and producers of visualization, it means thinking about information design as constructed space. I come from a tradition and a culture, particularly in visualization, where we're, we're challenged to question the authority of information, right? We're challenged to think about any information that's given to us as something that we can't take for granted. This is part of critical literacy, critical inquiry. And this really motivates a lot of the work that I do with visualization. Because when we create a visualization, what we're really doing is abstracting out a tiny differential, tiny slice of a larger narrative, right? So going back to this idea of, of narrative. If we think about a visualization as a narrative that's based on data, maybe not based on words, as opposed to a story, for example, that we might classically identify as a narrative. If we think about visualization as a narrative that's motivated by images, and colors and geometries. What does that mean for how we interact with the information that that narrative provides? So that's what this, this idea is getting at. There's this wonderful TED talk by Chimamanda Adichie called The Danger of a Single Story. And she says that power is the ability not just to tell the story of another person, but to make it the definitive story of that person. And I think this is true of data visualization as well. Right, this goes back to this idea of constructed space. This idea that when we are producing a visualization, we are deciding one particular form of way, one particular way of communicating a set of information. We are assuming particular aspects of knowledge that we want to give to someone else. And the same thing happens when we are reading or consuming a visualization or producing a visualization, right? So we have to be aware of this idea that a visualization is one particular organization of information that could manifest in many other ways. So this gets to the other I idea that motivates a lot of my work in visualization, which is that data are manifold and our choices of representation inform their interpretation and their use. So we sometimes like to believe that if we have a set of data, let's say data exists in sort of this abstract, multi-dimensional space, and we have a representation, so this could be a bar chart, for example, a very basic representation. We have this tendency to believe that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between data and their representation, right? This idea that for any set of data, there is one best visual representation of that data, and that we should be in pursuit of that particular best visual representation. But my work with visualization has shown me that that's not the case. And anyone who works in visualization will tell you that's not the case. And the challenge is getting people to understand that. Because the reality is that when we're creating a visual representation of set of data, which could be a bar chart again, or it could be a more abstract visualization, the path is much more complicated. We might take many steps forward, many, many steps back, to the left, to the right, upside down, before we get to a final representation that we're satisfied with. And the reality is that we're never gonna be fully satisfied with the representation that we choose either, because there are going to be many other ways that we can represent the same set of information, same set of data. So that brings me back again to this question. What does it mean to think of information visualization as a narrative medium? 
So the idea behind this talk, this visual narratives of Japan and self, is that my work in using visualization as a medium for integrating my background and interest in the sciences and my passion for Japan has also, has not only taught me a lot about Japan and Japanese culture and Japanese language and Japanese experience, but has also informed a lot of how I understand myself and the ways that I engage with the world around me, the way that I make conclusions about information that's given to me, and the ways in which other people make conclusions, the ways that other people experience the world around them. So I really want to think about sort of this multiplicity effect of visualization. And I'm going to do this by talking about a few different projects, and specifically the ways in which I've used them as a narrative medium. So I want to start by talking about how information visualization can be used as a medium for acknowledging the fragility of the human condition. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to meet someone by the name of Watanabe Hidenori. And he is a professor at Tokyo Metropolitan University. And I met him very shortly after I moved to Boston, um, almost two years ago. And he was a, a research fellow associate in the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies. And he had posted something in a Facebook group about how he was new to Boston and he was working on this project called the Hiroshima Archive. And if you're not familiar with the Hiroshima Archive, it's basically a, an online repository slash interactive digital map that pinpoints the geographic locations of experiences of people who actually survived the droppings of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in particular. There's a Nagasaki version of this as well, but I'm focusing right now on the Hiroshima version. So I had not heard about this Hiroshima Archive project, and I started playing around with it a little bit on the internet. And as you sort of play around with this map, you can click on individual points, individual pictures, and there are stories, there are testimonials of people who have experienced this particular event in human history. And I picked out a couple of these to give you a sense of what they look like. So this one is by Mitsuko Goto. You know, I, it says, I experienced the atomic bomb in the building of Hiroshima Girls High School for Teachers, which was 1.7 kilometers from the epicenter. After morning assembly under the burning sun, they were on the second floor. The seat was by the window. Recall seeing a, a white light, the building collapsing in the blink of an eye, not knowing if they were alive or dead, and not seeing anything but yellow smoke. This particular testimonial goes on to say, they had burns on their face, arms, leg, back, and hip. Their whole body was injured. Bruises, talk about heat, skin, blistering skin. Yellow pus, blisters, again, pain, scars, keloid on their arm. And the more that I read these testimonials, the more I started noticing how incredibly vivid they were in the imagery how descriptive they were of the actual sort of physical experience of the atomic bomb at this time in history. And so I reached out to Hidenori Sensei and I asked him, can I collaborate with you to create a visualization that sort of lifts out these narratives in a new way? And he agreed, he thought this was a wonderful idea. So he gave me access to the original text of all the testimonials in the Hiroshima archive and I did some text analysis on it. So I will show you that here. So this is a project that I ended up naming Space, Time, and Body Asunder, Mapping the Voices of the Hiroshima Archive. And again, this is based on an analysis of all the testimonials, all the texts of those testimonials in the Hiroshima Archive. So let me explain what's going on here. Every vertical column of blocks is a single testimonial, testimonial by one person. And each individual block, individual square, is one word from that testimonial. So the, the blocks in sequence follow the words in sequence of those testimonials. So just based on this kind of representation, we can see, for example, that some testimonials are shorter, some are much longer, and some are very, very, very long. So after doing some morphological analysis, which included taking the text of these testimonials, 
tokenizing them, so breaking them up, up into words, and then doing thematic analyses, so categorizing these words according to whether they were talking about the body or time or the physical world, person, space, place, events, things, and ideas. And I created this sort of pseudo matrix representation that colors each word according to the category in which they've been placed. So by doing this, we start to see, using color, sort of the distribution of categorical themes across all of these testimonials. So I can pick out a few in particular, such as body, and we see that across all these testimonials, there's lots and lots of language that talks about the body, right? Time as well body and time. Those two things are very integra integrally connected in this experience in Hiroshima. Physical world. So we have words like genbaku, atomic bomb. And I can do things like click on specific words and it will pull out all the instances across all the testimonials. That one doesn't have any in particular. The other ones that are interesting. Time, toki, right? So we can do this sort of representation to sort of pull out these categories of themes across all of these texts. And I can also sort these texts according to category. So again, we see that in red, discussions of the body occupy a large portion of these texts, followed by time. We go further down here, we have another representation, which is basically a tree map diagram that's showing the proportion of these texts that are occupied by, by particular words. So we can sort these things, and we see a cluster of words that talk about particular people. So naturally, watashi, I occupies a large portion of the space because these are first-person accounts of this experience. And we can do the same with other things like place and the body over here. So this was the first project that I had ever worked on of its kind in the sense of taking text that is very personal, very personally motivated, specifically testimonials of people who experienced a horrific event in human history, and used visualization to abstract something new out of those. And I wanted to be very careful about using visualization in this particular project, because I'm not in the business of using visualization to visualize things that don't need to be visualized, right? I'm not in the business of making things look pretty just for the sake of making them, making them look pretty. I wanted to use visualization in this particular project because I wanted to use it as a medium for pulling out and lifting out voices that people might not ordinarily listen to that much. And I think that's true of this particular archive, the Hiroshima archive. People in Japan studies probably know about the Hiroshima archive and sort of the data that's available in that. But people outside of that probably don't spend much time thinking at all about the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? So I wanted to use visualization as a medium for pointing people's attention to this particular subject matter in a way that they hadn't been uh, introduced to it before. So work on this project was interesting because sort of at the beginning, it sort of challenged me to think about visualization in a new way, but it also caused me to start thinking about different conceptions of self. And I think that often we tend to believe that our physical self is sort of the greatest, sort of most important principal manifestation of ourselves, right? But this project and looking at these testimonials showed to me that that's not always true for every single person. And particularly for people who experienced the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and this, this very physical experience, this visualization itself shows that that was a very scattering experience, a very dispersive experience. And we have people thinking about themselves not only in terms of the physical body, but also the self across time, and the self across space, and the self across the physical world, and the self in relation to other people, so things like family members, for example. And so this project really sort of attuned me to this idea that maybe I can use visualization 
as a medium, not only for communicating information, but thinking about how I conceive of myself and how other people conceive of themselves. Okay. So this is the first project I wanted to show. A second project, which is somewhat related to this as well, is something called Sonotoki, Memories of the March 11, 2011 Earthquake and Tsunami Disaster in Tohoku, Japan. This is based on a set of data that's available in what's called the Japan Disasters Archive. You may or may not be familiar with this. This is a digital archive that is hosted and created by Harvard, the Reichauer Institute of Japanese Studies. And it's, it's similar to the Hiroshima archive um, in that it includes testimonials, for example, of people who survived or experienced the uh, earthquake and tsunami disaster in Tohoku. But it also includes things like articles, videos, and tweets. And it sort of searches websites across the internet to pull content related to these particular events in history. So I discovered that this resource was available, and I discovered that this particular archive has an API. And similar to the way that the Hiroshima archive prevents, or presents testimonials, this particular Japan Disasters Archive also prevents a very small set of data that consists of testimonials as well. And specifically, it's a set of testimonials that are in response to this question down here. Oops. Sono toki, nani yoshite ka? What were you doing at that time? So what were you doing at the time that the earthquake and tsunami disaster struck? I used the API to pull out all of these testimonials, and like the Hiroshima Archive project, I did some text analysis. So I took all these testimonials, I tokenized them again, so that means, again, splitting them out into individual words, and I did some very basic word frequency analyses. So I looked at what particular words appear most frequently across all of these texts, and which words appear less frequently. And in what sorts of combinations do they appear? Do particular combinations of words appear in certain testimonials and not others? And then how does that relate to geography? So geographic distance, proximity to the actual earthquake itself. So this is my particular solution to this, this problem of how can you find a new way to visualize these particular testimonials. And it's, it's far from perfect, but what I hope to do in this particular representation is to capture something about both word frequency and word choice, and also geographic proximity to this disaster. So let me explain what's going on here. Every arc is a single testimonial. The length corresponds to the length of the testimonial. So longer arcs mean more words in a testimonial. And these arcs are really just sequences of dots each dot representing a single word in the testimonial. And what I've done here is I've pulled out particular words that appear across all the testimonials. So the one highlighted right here, this is yure, so this means to sway. So obviously, in an earthquake, things sway. So these are all the instances of this particular word that appear across all these testimonials. And they're, they're aligned right here. And so they appear in all these instances on this vertical axis, but they also appear in these other places throughout the testimonials. And it's probably hard to see with this resolution and this contrast, but this line right here, this diagonal line, represents geographic proximity, geographic distance from the epicenter of the earthquake. So these testimonials right here were very close to the epicenter of the earthquake. These ones out here are further away from the epicenter. So I can select other ones, Jishin, earthquake. Obviously, that is going to occur in pretty much all of these testimonials since they are in the Japan Disasters Archive. Ie, house, right? And then we have other ones that are less frequent. So this one is Hoso, broadcast. And so once you start looking at these words and sort of their geographic distribution, you start noticing that there are some words that appear closer to the epicenter and some words that appear further away from the epicenter. So that's represented down here. So if I hover over a particular word here, so we have the map of Japan. 
each circle is the ge geographic location of a particular testimonial, okay? And the highlighted, the red highlighted circles represent testimonials in which the highlighted word over here appears. So this is Gakko school. So it appears in these highlighted, these red highlighted testimonials here. And you'll notice that this right here is the epicenter of the earthquake. So we again have the word for to sway. Naturally, this is going to be dis distributed across pretty much all of Japan, where all of these testimonials are geographically located. And then if I take another example down here, oops, I talked about the word hoso, which means broadcast. I can find it again. There we go. And we start noticing that, again, looking at the map, the word for broadcast is distributed a little further off on the epicenter. So I presented this particular project to faculty at Harvard, um, actually the faculty who have created the Japan Disasters Archive. And their response was, well, first of all, they liked it. They thought it was interesting to look at. But they, their criticism, and this is a completely fair criticism, something that I still struggle a lot with in this particular project, is that these particular analyses don't necessarily reveal anything new that we wouldn't expect, right? Of course, we see the word for earthquake across all of these testimonials. And maybe, of course, we see that the word for broadcast is further away from the epicenter. That's maybe something that we wouldn't expect, or we would expect to see, regardless of the kinds of analyses that you would use to look at this. And I agree with that. I don't make any claim that this particular visualization reveals anything new about these particular testimonials. However, the claim I do make is that using visualization enables people who might not ordinarily interact with these kinds of testimonials it enables those people to interact with these testimonials in a new way, in a way that's very easily accessible. Right? Visualization aims for accessibility. So this was another sort of project in which I spent some time thinking about how you can use visualization as a medium for creating narratives, specifically narratives about Japan. Okay? Any questions about this project or the previous project? There'll be time at the end to, yes? Might be talking about this at the end, yeah. but can you talk a little bit about how you made the decision of what? Can you talk a little bit about how you made the decision of what what data to display visually, and a little bit about what programs you use to create them? Yes. So I'll I'll mention I'll respond to those briefly now, and we can talk a little bit more in depth later if you would like. So in this particular project, I wanted to look at just text. I wanted to focus my analysis on just text. So I, the, the data set itself of testimonials in the Japan Disaster Archive that are flagged by this question, they're, they're flagged specifically in this archive with this question. It's only one or 200 testimonials. And the testimonials, as you can see here, some of them are very short. So this one is a very, very short one, which is, this is basically a direct answer to the question. And then other ones are a little longer. So like that one's a little longer, that one is much longer. So people had different ways of responding to this particular question. So I decided to just use text analysis to look at just the texts. And I used a variety of tools to do that analysis. So I used a, an online, a Yahoo, a morphological, Japanese morphological analysis API to do the tokenization. And then I used tools like Python and PHP to just do some very basic word frequency counts. So there are other tools that can do this automatically. I tend to do most of my work um, using my own scripts, my own programming. And then the visualization itself is created in D3, which is a JavaScript library. Um, arguably the most popular JavaScript library for visualization on the internet, especially for interactive visualization. And then I'll, finally in the end, this project is hosted on uh, my own domain. So there's sort of all these infrastructure um, considerations to make too on top of the actual analysis. We can talk about that more later if you'd like. 
So I want to jump back to my presentation just briefly here. So these previous two projects, I'm going to come back here, thought about using visualization as a medium for, again, acknowledging the fragility of the human condition and sort of lifting out narratives about that fragility. More recently, I've started thinking about visualization as a medium for what I call crafting spaces of reconciliation through revealing multiplicities of perspective. So I have one particular project that I want to talk about in this respect. And this is a project that I just presented last week in Kyoto at a Digital Humanities Conference. So this is a project called Atomic Narratives. And the idea for this project emerged out of a combination of things. So they emerged out of a, a workshop that I attended last year at Harvard that Watanabe Sensei, uh, Professor Watanabe, had actually organized around using the Hiroshima archive as a tool to bring Japanese high school students and American high school students together to talk about history using technology. So as part of that particular workshop, one person brought up the question, about how Japanese and US history textbooks differ in their description of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I found this very interesting and potentially very compelling from a visualization perspective. So in this project, I use visualization to explore just how US and Japanese high school history textbooks differ in the way that they portray and depict Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the atomic bombings of them. So this is a guided interactive visualization. I'll show you the, the link to this at the end if you want to see it up close. Basically, you scroll, you scroll through the entire website and it produces a variety of different visualizations that guide you through a new understanding of the texts. So let me explain what's going on here. So we have 11 blocks. So these are individual textbooks. They're marked US and Japan. So we have seven US high school history textbooks and four Japanese high school history textbooks. And every small dot in these larger blocks represents a single word. So again, going back to this sort of tokenized representation of these texts. So we see that, for example, this particular US history textbook is much longer than some of the other ones. Now in these particular texts, we're only looking at specific excerpts from the, from the textbooks, okay? And we're looking at specifically the texts around the actual mention of the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as the structures immediately before and after those particular sentences. So for most of these, if not all of them, this covers anywhere from the Battle of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, all the way to the dropping of the atomic bombs Japan's surrender and the end of the Second World War. So all of these texts are uh, reduced to just those particular sections of the textbooks. It doesn't represent the entire textbook. So with this particular project, I wanted to find a few different ways of visualizing the texts in a way that would make people think about the texts in a new way. So the first and most basic thing that I did was after tokenizing these texts, I did some part of speech analysis, okay? So I did some very basic natural language processing analysis and determined what words in these texts are nouns, what are adjectives, what are verbs, and what are adverbs. So we see here that nouns are purple, adjectives are orange, verbs are red, and adver adverbs are green. With this very basic representation, we see a couple of things. So first of all, we see that the US history textbooks, these excerpts, are quite diverse in terms of the distribution of nouns, adverbs, verbs, and adjectives. But in comparison, we see that the Japanese textbooks are not so diverse. And specifically, the Japanese textbooks are very noun heavy, right? So if you actually look at these texts, you see that there's just a lot of nouns with very few adjectives. If we sort these part of speech tags, we can see this distribution a little bit more clearly. So again, purple represent nouns. And we see that 
these Japanese texts are very noun heavy, whereas with the US history textbooks, we see a greater proportion of adjectives, adverbs, things like that. So here is an excerpt from a US history textbook and from a Japanese textbook from this particular data set. And if you can read it, it says, the deadline passed on 8.15 on August 6th, flying at 31,600 feet. A B-29 bomber named Emil Gay released the first, or the five-ton uranium bomb nicknamed Little Boy. Goes on to describe a few other things about this particular incident. Talks about specific numbers. So this particular text is very number heavy, very descriptive and very specific in terms of numerical facts. And then if you look at this Japanese excerpt right here, so Nihongo Seifu ga Potsdam Dengo no Mokusatsu to America wa Chitukatsu ni Jiken ga Seiko shita bakari no Genshi Bakudan no Hachigatsu Muika ni Hiroshima ni Tokashi Hachigatsu Kokonaka ni Nagasaki ni mo Tokashi da So when the Japanese government did not respond to the Potsdam Declaration, the United States, having just successfully tested them, dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima on August 6th and again on Nagasaki on August 9th. So compared to the, the US excerpt right here, very objective, very straightforward, very few adjectives, very few extra descriptors of the events in history, just telling what happened and when it happened. Okay. So in addition to looking at part of speech, I began to wonder if, you know, based on this differential distribution of, for example, adjective usage, can we say something about polarity of the words used? So this representation illustrates polarity, objectivity, or subjectivity of the words in these particular texts. So the darker red the circle is, that means the word is more subjective based on natural language processing, a particular uh, dictionary of semantic analysis that I used. We can talk a little bit more about that later if you'd like. And then a lighter gray, words indicate more objective words. So just like the previous one, we can sort these texts based on polarity, polarity of words. And we see that, for example, this particular US history text has a larger proportion of more subjective language in it. So this is interesting only because we begin to see a picture of something that's occurring a compromise that's occurring between use of adjectives, for example, and the polarity of language that's being used, right? So some of these adjectives are par particularly subjective in their connotation, and we have a way of representing that visually. In comparison, we see that these Japanese texts have a lower proportion of subjective words, again, based on the semantic analyses that I used, okay? So we can start to wonder or start making sort of assumptions or conclusions about the relative objectivity of these texts. And we might say that the US history textbooks are a little bit more subjective, have a little bit more latitude in the, the diversity of language that they can use to describe these events. Whereas the Japanese texts are more objective, right? Much more straightforward in their depiction of these events. We can also look at particular themes in the texts. So naturally, any history textbook tends to follow a pretty standard form, which is specify one event in history happened and explain it, move on to the next event, next event in sequence, right? So there's a temporal representation. And we found that looking at all of these texts, they nearly all sort of agreed on what particular uh, events in history they covered with some slight differences. So in this representation, we've gone through and tagged all the individual sentences that relate to particular uh, events in history. So for example, the Potsdam Declaration, or the Battle of Okinawa, or the dropping of the atomic bombs. And we've colored them accordingly. And we can do things like hover over individual sections. And this is, in the lower left-hand corner, island hopping in the Pacific. So these two US history textbooks talk about island hopping in the Pacific, whereas the other ones don't. Or if you look at this one, this is a, dis a discussion of justification of the atomic bombs, sort of 
looking back or retrospectively on history. And we see that this occurs in a few of the US history textbooks, but not any of the Japanese history textbooks that we looked at. So we can pull out specific themes and see how they compare in terms of coverage as well as length across these texts. So this is the actual dropping of the atomic bombs. Predic predictably, they all talk about it. All the texts talk about the dropping of the atomic bombs, but to different extents, different lengths, right? So we see that this particular textbook presumably has maybe one sentence that mentions the dropping of the atomic bombs. This particular Japanese textbook talks at much greater length. Same with this US history textbook. And then this US history textbook talks about it in one place and then continues to talk about it in another place. This one talks about strategy, about using the atomic bombs. So whether or not the atomic bombs should be used and how they should be used. So we see that this particular theme occurs only in US history textbooks, almost all of them except for a couple. And again, we see differential distributions of lengths of the extent to which these are discussed. We can look at other ones like the firebombing of Japanese cities. And we see that this one occurs a little bit more frequently in the Japanese textbooks. Not covered to the same extent in US history textbooks. And then this one, again, like I mentioned before, talks about justification of the atomic bombs. Were the, were the atomic bombs justified? Was the, was the government justified in dropping them? And we see that these particular US history textbooks talk a little bit about justification. And then this first one and this fifth one talk at great length about justification. And this one in particular, this is a really interesting text because it offers a lot of different perspectives um, and this is actually the most comprehensive textbook that I found in my data collection um, in terms of the number of perspectives that I offered on whether or not the, the bombings were justified. So we can do this sort of thematic analysis. And this becomes a little bit more interesting once we align themes across all the texts. Are there particular themes, particular events that are discussed in all of the texts? Are there some themes that are discussed in some of the texts but not in others? So we can use a technique from uh, DNA sequence analysis, uh, sequence alignment, to do this very task of aligning the texts to each other based on content coverage. So again, here, each color represents a particular theme, a unique theme. And what I've done is I've just collapsed these texts down now into sequences of themes. So we're not looking at word counts anymore. We're just looking at the order in which these particular themes are discussed. So this is dropping of the atomic bombs, and we see that, again, this occurs across all of the texts. Same with Japan's surrender. So it's very common to see across all of these texts a sentence that says the bombs were dropped, and then very shortly thereafter, Japan surrendered. This is sort of the standard narrative around the end of the Second World War. And then we start seeing things that are more unique to some texts as opposed to others. So for example, this particular Japanese text talks about the Cairo conference, but none of the other texts mention this, at least in the excerpts that we're including in this particular analysis. Or we can look at other things like Battle of Iwo Jima, and this is a very popular thing to talk about in US history textbooks, not so popular in Japanese history textbooks. So we can begin to see, using the sort of alignment of themes, this idea that there's a canonical narrative that's forming across all of these texts. And how can we characterize that? Is there a particular set of events, a particular narrative, that all of these different textbooks have in common in how they depict the end of the Second World War? And so I wanted to find another way to represent this idea of cohesion or adherence to or dispersion from a canonical core narrative. And to do, that, to do that, I use some network analyses. So this is a, a network that shows relationships between all the different themes that I just talked about. So for example, 
the dropping of the, of the bombs or the Potsdam Declaration or the Cairo Conference, and the extent to which they appear together across these texts. So if I hover over particular ones, this central node here says dropping of atomic bombs. This occurs in all of the texts, so it appears at the center of the network. Here we have the Potsdam Declaration. And every circle, every little dot, blue and red, around this network represent a word from either a Japanese textbook or a US history textbook. And so the red dot represents words from Japanese textbooks, and the blue dots represent words from US history textbooks. And we start to see that there are some differences in the ways that these texts are dispersed around this quote unquote canonical narrative. So we pull out just a few. This is an example of the words from one US history textbook. So we see that for the most part, this particular text is pretty tightly oriented around sort of this canonical narrative. So this includes things like Battle of Okinawa, dropping the atomic bombs, Japan's surrender. But in contrast, we see that this particular U.S. history textbook, this is a different textbook. It, it, it's pretty tightly con constrained around the center of the canonical narrative, but it's also a little bit more dispersive from that center, right? So it talks about topics, events, that are a little bit your, more unique to that particular text and not covered to the same extent in other, in other textbooks. So for example, this particular textbook talks about the Japanese peace faction in the, in the Japanese cabinet. And this one down here talks about the transition of President Truman into the office shortly before the dropping of the atomic bombs. So those are two US history textbooks. A Couple of Japanese history textbooks. So this is one Japanese history textbook, pretty tightly <coughs> constrained around the canonical narrative. And this one too is pretty tightly constrained. So we see that there are some differences between the US and the Japanese history textbooks in the ways that they sort of organize the narrative around the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And my objective in doing this particular visualization project was to especially get US students, high school students, to think about these narratives in a new way. Because if you're a US history student in high school, you're probably given one textbook that's determined by your teacher. And that is the only representation of history you're probably ever exposed to. If not the only, then the very first one you're given exposure to. And so I want people to understand that there are multiple ways of framing this particular event in history that exists outside of the textbook that you were exposed to yourself. So I hope to expand this particular project a little bit further and include many more textbooks and do a larger scale analysis across many, many different texts. And that's really one of the benefits of using visualization in a project like this is that obviously you're not going to sit down and read the entire corpus of history textbooks that exists in the world to look at differences in those narratives. But visualization gives you a very easy way of looking at that without doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So I wanna close now with one more note about information visualization as a narrative medium. And that is about using visualization as a medium for constructing narratives of not only time and place, but also self, right? So the, the kinds of projects I just showed to you are narratives about time and place, but they also show us a little bit something different about how we engage with the world ourselves. And Anat Singh in an article on called On Non-Scalability says something about how conceptualizing the world and making the world are wrapped up with each other, at least for those with the privilege to turn their dreams into action. And I think this is true of visualization as well. So I could rewrite this to say that data and their visualization are wrapped up with each other, at least for those with the privilege to turn their dreams into action. And this is really just to say that we're challenged as critical practitioners of visualization both producers of visualization, as well as consumers, readers of visualization, to think about how we're navigating this space effectively, 
right? Think about how we're intentional in the way that we read a visualization or produce a visualization and how we're intentional with the kinds of knowledge that we generate on our own and the kinds of knowledge that are, is given to us. Because importantly, creating and reading visualization is inflected by culture, society, and experience. And this is really just to say that a narrative is never isolated in, in its existence, right? But it's really dependent upon everything else around it. So it's dependent on, upon how we interact with that narrative. It's dependent upon all of the biases of experience that we bring to that, to that particular event of reading a narrative. And it's dependent upon the ways in which we want to communicate to other people, right? So I want to encourage us all to think about using visualization as a critical medium for doing that work. Okay. So ultimately, visualization has never been a destination for me. I've never at any point in my lot, life thought Yes, this is what I want to do. I want to visualize data. But it has been a point of arrival. And it's turned out to be the most effective medium for me personally to think about the way that I do my research. And I appreciate sort of the, the opportunities it gives me to encourage other researchers to think about their research in a new way, right? So there are ways that you all can use visualization integrated into your own research practices that might reveal something that you might not have thought about. It may not reveal any new conclusions but it can often reveal new paths of inquiry, new questions to discover. So with that, thank you very much, and I am happy to answer any questions in about four minutes. So we have about four minutes, and I believe if you were supposed to move to another room. Can you hear me? All right. Now, yeah. I'm just curious your selection process for textbooks. Um, I know that the sample, is that frequency of usage or popularity of, how did you, you know, discern your sample? So this, what I showed you is a, a very small prototype of something that needs to be more rigorously defined. So the, the data collection for this prototype includes, I have a colleague in Japan who used to work in a Japanese high school who knew what Japanese textbooks are used in high school courses, mm -hmm. and she had access to those textbooks, mm -hmm. so she got those. For the US history textbooks, I was able, I have a couple teacher friends who are able to point me in the direction of some of the key US history textbooks that are used currently mm -hmm. in the country, so I use some of those. And then I also, since I work in a library, I also did some searching in the library and saw what we had in stock mm -hmm. and, uh, and avail available to be checked out. So that the particular, especially the U.S. collection of textbooks, is interesting because it includes contemporary textbooks, but it also includes a couple from the 1960s and 1970s. And that's something that I want to explore a little bit further with a larger data set, is temporal changes in these narratives, too. Yeah. I'm curious about your selection mm -hmm. Um, hello, um, so my name is Joseph, uh, I, um, I just wanted to ask you a question about your sort of um, method of realization. Um, so, so I understand that uh, uh, that your uh, visualizations were very uh, colorful I, I, and had a variety of shapes in order to sort of um, draw people in from all over um, to learn about um, these aspects of history. I, uh, I was wondering, uh, at any point did you have um, sort of an interest in art, like, uh, or were these visualizations um, influenced by abstract art at all, like just to just sort of get people to look at it? So my interest in visualization is also partially motivated by a long time interest in graphic design. So I have an interest in design, more generally speaking, not just information design. Um, so a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the research that I do um, involves thinking about how to incorporate like basic design principles, like basic graphic design principles into visualization work in order to make visualization quickly accessible to people. So the, the work that I do is at least partially inspired by um, my experience studying abstract art graphic design, design principles. 